uh, friends, uh, as you know, uh, we have uh, this important series of 75 lectures to uh, celebrate the India's uh, 75th year of uh, independence and for which the government of India has given responsibility to many departments. And uh, the responsibility which has been given to ICR uh, is uh, also manifold, but one of the activities is to have the lectures of eminent persons every week. And till date, uh, today is the uh, 14th lecture, uh, which we are uh, going to organize uh, by uh, Dr. Rajiv Vasne. Uh, today we have uh, with us uh, in the uh, audience, uh, many eminent uh, persons, many vice chancellors. We have uh, Dr. P.L. Gautam. We have uh, with us uh, Dr. T.R. Sharma, uh, Deputy Director General. Uh, many directors are uh, present and other persons um, uh, in thousands, they are connected to our other side where it is being uh, live streamed. And that is uh, your ICR 75 lecture series dot webcon events dot com, uh, which provides a connectivity to about 10,000 persons. Uh, friends, uh, today's uh, session is going to be uh, delivered uh, by uh, Professor Rajiv Varsne and it will be chaired by none other than our Deputy Director General Crop Science, who is also an eminent scientist in the field of genomics. Uh, Dr. Rajiv Vasne is agricultural research scientist specializing in genomics and molecular breeding with more than 20 years of service in international agriculture. He is currently serving as Global Research Program Director Genetic Gains and Director Center of Excellence in Genomics and System Biology at the International Crop Research Institute for semi arid Tropics, popularly we know as ICRISAT, very uh, prestigious uh, international institute. He is an honorary or adjunct professor in more than 10 universities or institutes in Australia, China, Ghana, India, including Murdoch University, the University of Western Australia, the University of Queensland, Australia. He is a globally recognized leader for his work on genome sequencing, genomics assisted breeding, and translational genomics in legume and cereal crops and capacity building in developing countries. For his outstanding and seminal contributions, Professor Vasne has been honored with several fellowships, awards, and honorary positions at international level. For instance, Professor Vasne is an elected fellow uh, of all four science academies of India. Very rare opportunity. INSA, NASI, IASC, NAS, several foreign science academies, including German National Science Academy, the World Academy of Science, American Association of Advancement of Science, Crop Science Society of America, and another prestigious American Society of Agronomy. He is recipient of several prestigious awards, including Shanti Swaru Bhatnagar Award. Very, uh, very rare uh, to get this award. And uh, Rafi Ahmed Kidway Award, uh, another prestigious award. Uh, these are the most coveted science and agriculture awards from Government of India. Professor Vasne, with more than 400 research papers, find it more than 400 research papers in high impact factor journals, including 15 papers in nature journals, is the first and only Indian agriculture scientist, plant bio, uh, biologist with more than 100 H index, very rare phenomenon. He has been recognized as highly cited researcher by Thomson writers for last eight years in row and one of the 10 influential Indian scientists. I repeat, one of the 10 most influential in Indian scientists by Times of India, which is a leading Indian daily newspaper. Now the topic on which he is going to talk uh, I will leave it to the chair, uh, chairman of uh, today's uh, session, uh, Professor T.R. Sarma uh, to uh, just say a few words before and invite the speaker. And uh, the topic is, uh, as you know, the genomics and breeding innovations in agriculture, which is a very important topic. And he is the master uh, for this topic, uh, which is very important. Just you see if the 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 kind of stresses which we have got, the kind of food production we have to make, kind of nutrition security we have to make, 
So this topic makes very uh, important role. And uh, as I told you, Dr. Sarma is also a leading uh, uh, scientist uh, in this area. So I hand over the floor to Dr. T.R. Sarma uh, to invite the speaker and to say a few words. Thank you, Dr. Sarma, and uh, thank you, Dr. Vasne. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Dr. Agrawal. Good afternoon to all. Uh, today's distinguished participants and our distinguished speaker, Dr. Rajiv Vashne, other participants from different organizations, former DDGs, vice chancellors of different universities, students, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great privilege for me to be here this afternoon to listen to none other than Dr. Rajiv Vashne, who has already been introduced by Dr. Akarwal, our DDG Education. And we know that this is a very eminent series of lectures being delivered by eminent scientists. And we have, this is the 14th lecture in this series. We have planned many such lectures in the years to come, the days to come. So I don't know what to say about Dr. Rajiv Vashne because it has, he has already been introduced. But uh, I know him for the past more than uh, 21 years, yes, 21 years as a very close friend and distinguished scientist, particularly working in genomics. And a few years back, I would like to tell all the participants here that uh, pulses are being considered as orphan cross as far as genomics is concerned and genomic resources are concerned. But now if we just Google with Dr. Raji Vashne and pulses, I think you will get thousands of hits in Google search, which itself says that Dr. Vashne has made these crops as a model crops for understanding genomics and genomic assisted breeding by his efforts of sequencing many genome crops starting from pigeon pea, chickpea, not only one line, but many, many lines and with international uh, partners and international consortium. Uh, I used to discuss with him that now we have enough genomic resources available with us in almost all crops and more than 350 crop plants have already been sequenced. So we should make use of this information in developing crop varieties, which ultimately benefit the farming community. And I'm really happy to say that uh, for the past four or five years, Dr. Rajiv Vashne has changed his course of action and research towards utilizing this huge number of genomic resources available in not only in pulses, but millet and many other crops, many, many crops, and he has done work in that towards development of climate resilient varieties. And one of the varieties which was last year released by through AICRP system uh, in which Dr. Rajiv Vashne has contributed along with IARI and other scientists from ICR system. It's a chickpea varieties, first variety derived marker assisted selection distant to drought as well as cesarean. So I'm sure today he's going to tell us uh, more such examples in his programs, which are really going to benefit society at large and scientific community specific, specific. So it's my privilege to invite Dr. Rajiv Vashne for this particular 
series of eminent scientists and the topic is genomics and breeding innovations in agriculture which is a topical subject nowadays and i'm sure all of us will be benefited from his talk dr rajiv washte please thank you very much sir and uh, good afternoon everybody i feel very privileged and honored to speak in this important session and especially under the chairmanship of dr tr sharma who has been a a very good well wisher mentor and friend in the area of genomics and genomics assisted breeding as dr sharma mentioned and so thanks a lot sir for very elaborate introduction i'm very much grateful to dr rc agrawal deputy director general education for this invitation and giving me this opportunity i think that uh, it's really an honor for us to share our work and views in this important session i could see from this list of participants there are many many senior authorities and personalities and higher positions holders ddgs vice chancellors directors and many well wishers and my friends and collaborators are there so i'm really grateful to all of you to join this particular session hopefully you can see my presentation now you can see my slide and you can hear me yes sir. yes please yes, go ahead thank you thank you very much once again so it's great for our country and that we are celebrating this azadi ka amrit mahotsav celebrating 75 years of india's independence and in this series i am really grateful to icr and uh, icr leadership dr mohpatra sir dr t r sharma dr agrawal for this invitation now i would like to have not very technical presentation but little bit generic but also highlighting the role of genomics and breeding in agriculture so before that let me congratulate all fellow indians on this occasion that now we are completing or we will be completing 75 years of india's independence next year but nevertheless we already started to have this function and we as indian feel very proud of that one so and i feel really very excited to be one of those speaker in this prestigious series of icr so congratulations and best wishes to all indian friends fellow indians so thank you very much now i would like to talk about agriculture and when we talk indian agriculture sometimes people start to put different kind of views but here i would like to mention indian agriculture is a success story i would like to repeat again this is a success story how let's see this thing first is that india being very ancient civilization agriculture also dates back to indus valley civilization at present the country ranks first in the world with highest net cropped area and it ranks second worldwide in farm outputs as per 2018 data indian agriculture employs more than 50% of the indian workforce and contributes about 17 to 18% of country gdp in terms of that commodities export if you would like to see then this is in the range of about 33.4 billion dollar but somehow as a general person or if you talk general people they don't recognize this importance of indian agriculture on the other hand if you talk about space research where we are india is are generating about 2.5 to 3 billion dollar we are having much more fascination excitement towards that than agriculture because we don't recognize the importance nevertheless this is that thing and now if you would like to see the contribution to gdp you can see and because we are celebrating 75 years of india's independence so i will like to take you back and also in, um, back and forth so if you see from 1960s the good thing is that agriculture output is continuously increasing of course in initial 2 3 decades we had lot of impact because of the green revolution but nowadays we are having this agriculture output coming from the high value horticulture and livestock commodities but in general agriculture is producing about 480 billion dollar net value for the country now when we are talking 75 years of india's independence as i said so i would like to take you little bit back in 1960 70s that decade based on my reading and some of you may already be aware 
that at that time point india was struggling in terms of its food security at that time point dr paul yerlik wrote i think an infamous book the called population bomb in 1968 and this book is having lots of disappointing passages and not really good picture about india like for instance the battle to feed all of humanity is over in the 1970s hundreds of millions of people will starve to death in spite of any crash program ever upon now i have yet to meet anyone familiar with the situation who thinks that india will be self sufficient i don't see india could possibly feed 200 million more people by 1980 so those kind of articulation predictions were made in this book nevertheless we all know that we had green revolution thanks to dr norman borlock dr m s swaminathan their dedicated work and of course not only that Paul, uh, the science, but also not only the technology like varieties, but agronomic inputs, policy interventions, and political support, etc. That India delivered this green revolution, and this green revolution not only in India but South Asia as well. And in parallel or subsequently, we are also aware about the work of Professor Gurudev Khush, that who that because of his hard work, dedication, we also had these dwarfing. rice varieties so i think wheat and rice varieties they were delivered to country i had a privilege to meet all the three of them individually several time but of course this was really important very interesting exciting for me when i met three of them together in the same room and that was way back in 2003 when i used to work in germany and i went for a conference anyway so what i wanted to say that we know about this green revolution in wheat and rice and this happened mainly because of the transformational genetics and breeding which is a topic of today's presentation we know about wheat about these uh, rst genes and rice also sd genes and of course not only the technology but other things were also important recently professor deepak pantel has published very nice article in dialogue science scientists and society very nice article if you have not read i would strongly recommend to read it now in this article you will see that how the cereal production has increased population has also increased in india but i think that we are having really good the good good how should i say that good magnitude the cereal production happens in much more higher magnitude than population and if you see land use for cereal this is not going up because we know that population is increasing but even with the limited land you are having large number large amount of the cereals and when you talk about cereals then again you would like to see this thing in the case of rice from 50s 26 million ton to be reach about more than 104 million tons in wheat about 100 million ton even maize core cereals including pulses this data is old but now currently we are having more than 24 million ton pulses also so i think that green revolution has delivered on this important cross but not only that one but even other crops like pulses etc so india has done remarkable job and some of you may already have read this paper this is also very important paper from dr yap op yadav dr mohpatra dr dillan and dr dv singh and this paper also indicates very clearly that how that productivity has increased either this is the case of wheat rice pearl millet even in sorghum so basically across all the different cereal crops we have made the significant progress now so as a result we had this green revolution we had surplus production of many crops etc and india has become a food secure country from a grain deficient nation and now we have even 1.3 billion people more than three times than what we used to have in 1960s but now we are producing more than 100 million tons rice 100 million ton wheat the lead exporter per capita net availability has also increased from 312 grams from 1950 so we are talking 75 years back and this is the progress what indian agriculture has done in 75 years that now we have increased to 512 despite that exponential growth in the population so we can celebrate on the 70th occasion about the indian agriculture and we always need to put that very positive articulation about that contribution of agriculture so friends we can say that in summary Paul Ehrlich's prediction about famines, massive deaths in India were found to be false. Although we still have some issue of the food security, nutrition security, or maybe accessibility to the food, so these are the different issues. In this context, Jonathan Last, 
a famous author who wrote this book, What to Expect When No One is Expecting America's Coming Demographic Disaster in 2013, he mentioned in his book that Populism Bomb is one of the most spectacularly foolish books ever published. So this does not mean that Paul Ehrlich stopped to write the books. He's writing books. But I think that now if you see his articulation, they are entirely different. And he's still writing the book. And recently, he wrote a very nice book in 2020, Population, Agriculture, and Biodiversity, together with Professor Perry Gustafson, Professor Peter Revin, and this thing. And I happen to be one of those reviewers of this book. And this book is a very sensible book. So I reviewed this book together with Professor Gurdev Kush, and I also recommend it that well, this book should be read in terms of that when we are talking about the food security. So, so anyway, to make long story short, India has done a great work and last 75 years are fantastic spectrum of progress. Now where we are and where we would like to go. Now, if you see the population of India, huh, then this is already 1.39 billion. Today I saw this population clock and this is 1.39 billion. And this population clock is ticking and this was a screenshot from 941. Because of these things, India will become unfortunately the most populous nation in, in just 20, next another 20, 30 years or so. Not a good news, but we need to feed all these people. And we know about the climate change and climate change is happening around the world, even including India. And we are already seeing these frequent droughts, flood condition, heat waves, etc. There are lots of prediction about the yield reduction, etc. There are already predictions in the case of rice and wheat that depending on the different prediction you can have. 2.5% to 10%, 18 to 23%, for instance, in the case of wheat and rice, little bit lesser. In some crops, even they say there will be some positive impact. But having said that, we need to develop the varieties which can deliver more, even in this climate change conditions. Now, this is another slide which I would like to show. And if we are not aware that if you see the water usage in agriculture, this is incredibly very, very high. Even if you compare with China, United States, many other countries, now this is started to go down because they are recognizing the importance of the water in our country. This is still continuing to be going higher. On the other hand, we know that 50% of the India will be facing high to extremely high water stress in coming years. So the question is, when you are having that much usage of agriculture, you are also aware that that much water shortage we will have just think that what we would like to do and how what kind of agriculture we will be we would like to see and other thing there are many good things about green revolution we also are seeing lots of critics as well so now if you see the fertilizer usage of course in china this was much more higher they started to go down but in india also this is continuing pesticides is continuing high so we need to think about the environmental sustainability also when we are talking about the agriculture. So I think these are very important. Now, as per Niti Ayo for the 2032 or 33, we need about 337 million ton food grains. We are producing right now about 305 million tons. So we need to have about 32 million ton. If you see the cereal, then you are having 279. We need to go 301. And oil seed, this is very, very important that we need to pay attention to the oil seed that we need around 100 million ton in just next 10 years. And we are having just 36 million ton. We need to go three times higher. In pulses, as I said, so last few years have been very good years, thanks to ICR, ICR institutes, and of course, the policies, etc., that we have made a significant progress in the pulses. It still, we need 35 million tons. So we need to have these, we need to go to that kind of production, but we don't have that much land. So what we need to do, we need to think about the yield. And as we know that we are having a different kind of yield, like theoretical yield, experimental or station yield, potential farm yield, actual farm yield farmers, they are harvesting this kind of produce. And many of us, we are working on this aspect or here. So now as a scientist in the area of the crop improvement, at least we can try to address some of these yield gap in this side so that we can enhance that one. So having said that one, population, climate change, water usage, and of course, environmental sustainability, etc. I think we all are having a big challenge. And this big challenge is to produce more from the less. And that too, while taking care of the environmental sustainability, 
and in this direction crop improvement community across the country in partnership with international organizations like acres aid airy semet or many other organizations they are contributing to agriculture here so basically all of us in general what we have been doing or we need to continue to do to develop the better technology better varieties which are disease resistant pest resistance environmental stress tolerant like heat or drought and nowadays we are talking a lot about the nutrition also because this is another important area that we in agriculture we need to focus on that one so basically we need to enhance the productivity while taking care of the environmental sustainability so this is very important thing now many of us have already been working on this different aspect by using the different kind of technology so now the question is can genomics play some important roles can breeding can contribute something of course breeding has been done by together with different disciplinary sciences but now with this new novel technology what we can do many of you are already about uh, are aware about the genomics but if not then basically the genome is a set or basically what that how do we look like what kind of function our body as a human being or plant or animal is having they are all controlled by the genes and if we would like to understand the genomic composition then we need to assemble all those genes and this is called genome basically the repertoire of the entire set of the genes of that cell or that organism because of the emphasis and of on the human health and we have recognized the importance of the human health during this pandemic that how important it is but nevertheless human health and agriculture they are two important basic necessity for the human being and because of the emphasis on the human health and the genomics advances way back in 1990 international community embarked on the human genome sequencing project this took about 13 years 3 billion dollar and idea was to understand the genes related to the different diseases health related stuff etc so this was a big significant progress in this direction but then scientific community start to think that well we cannot spend 3 billion dollar every time we cannot spend 13 years every time we need to have some new advances so that we can use these sequencing technology sequence the genomes of human being in the faster manner and not only in the human but also we can go in the plant side animal side etc so as a result in last few years there has been significant progress in the genome sequencing technology dr t r sharma has been a pioneer in the sequencing technology he has when he was at nrcpv he has adopted several of these versions and many other organizations in india they have been working on these aspects so we moved from the capillary sequencing next gen third gen sequencing etc so i think that these cost has become also cheaper and the uh, output has become much more higher and now so we have making lot of advances in genomics way back in 2005 when i was in germany and when there were these advances were happening so for instance arab dust genome was sequenced in 2000 rice genome came in 2002 then improved quality version came in 2005 and then genomics was move there was a boom of genomics at that time point we thought that well people are just talking about the use of markers marker assisted selection etc how we can use the genomics to assist breeding so basically we gave a concept of the genomics assisted breeding for crop improvement and we provided this concept in the 10th anniversary issue of the trends in plant sciences and as a result this technology has become or this concept has become much more powerful now coming back to those crops which are important for india and also the dry land tropics in africa because as you know that ikri said works on six important crops three cereals sorghum palm millet and finger millet three legumes chickpea pigeon pea and groundnut and if we are talking about these crops then at that time point way back in 2005 we did not have that much genomic resources so then we wanted to develop those genomic resources with this objective in 2007 we established the center of excellence in genomics and systems biology and we established larger partnership of the of the organization mainly with the icr institute dbt institute csr institute the state agriculture university in india and also large number of partners in other countries of asia africa europe and united states so we feel very lucky to have very broad partnership and as a result of the genomic center and the partnership we thought that if we would really would like to make some some advances in these crops we need to sequence the genomes and what we did that at our center together with the partners and i already mentioned large number of na names and the partners around the world we sequenced the genome of pigeon pea way back in 2012 chickpea palm millet in the case of groundnut or peanut we are having the allo tetraploid so we sequenced both genomes 
of uh, initially, initially the wild species, then we have sequenced the tetraploid species, subspecies Festigeta, subspecies Hypogea. This is a huge work, but then together with partners, we can deliver that one. And not only those genomes, I think we also have co-led and contributed several other genomes, including Sesame, Moonveen, Ajukeveen, Jetropop, recently just now we have completed P and Soybean, etc. So, and we feel very happy that ICRISAT through our genomic center, we have sequenced more than 10 different crop genomes. And I think which is really good. And thanks to our collaborators and my colleagues, from ICRISAT and partners. So I think that we have done this huge work. And so basically that we can understand these genomes and not only ICRISAT, many other institutes in India, including IRI, University of Delhi South Campus, National Institute of Plant Genome Research, PAU Ludhiana, and many other institutes in India, they are heavily involved in the genome sequencing. And this recent paper, when I was reading, I realized that India has contributed to, to several key genomes, including rice, tomato, chickpea, palmillet, wheat, and I know several colleagues, they are already sitting in this, um, uh, they are joining, the, they already have joined the session, and so thanks to them for all their hard work. And not only that one, India has also, I think that they have been talking, they were working or having the interaction with this another big project called Earth Biogenome Project, and under this Earth Biogenome Project, which is a consortium of several countries, several organizations that they would like to create, a new foundation for the biology to drive solution for preserving biodiversity and sustaining high human society. And I think that, I don't know that which stage they are, but I think that joining this Earth Biogenome Project will also be very important. I know that DBT and other organizations were involved. Now you can ask that, well, we are talking about wheat, rice, etc. Why you are talking about palmillet? Many people ask, but probably in India, people will not ask because palmillet is also a very important crop. But I would like to mention one, is quick, a quick uh, story here that many crops like wheat, rice or so, and I was uh, talking about this climate change. And if you are having the temperature more than 35 degrees Celsius in many crops, you don't have even this pollen formation or seed setting, etc. But in the case of palm millet, even at the 42 degrees Celsius, you can have the seed setting. So when we sequence the genome of palm millet, we ask this question that what what kind of genes are making palm millet so much drought and heat tolerant? And then we identified several set of the genes which are associated with, for instance, Bexi biosynthesis pathway, etc. So what I'm trying to say that by having this information, you cannot just enhance the yield of palm millet, but also you can try to use these genes through the different method, either genome editing, etc. And you can also improve the yield of wheat, rice, maize, etc. And not only this one, I will give another example of pigeon pea, which is called orphan crops, especially in North America or so, where soybean is very, very important crop. But in soybean, there is an issue of the Asian soybean rust and majority, uh, you don't have the natural variation for Asian rust in soybean. And long back when we were just sequencing the pigeon pea genome, Jonathan Jones from the Sanisbury laboratory, he and we have interacted, we provided our genome sequence to him. And through his work, they identify one pigeon pea gene which confers full resistance to Asian rust. And you can see that pigeon pea genome is not just useful for pigeon pea, this is also useful for even the leading crops like soya bean. So this is the way that you have that thing. Now, when you sequence the genome, this does not mean like for instance, in chickpea, we got 28,000 genes that these genes, they are working in all the tissues at all the stages. So now in those cases, what we would like to see that basically we would like to develop or like as a child, as a children, we were reading about the Express and Atlas, which we know that which country or which city is present in which country, etc. In the similar fashion, we have developed the Gene Express and Atlas for chickpea, pigeon pea, and groundnut while sequencing, doing the basically RNA sequencing of more than 30 tissues from each of these uh, legume crop. We have developed the Gene Express and Atlas, and we are using the Gene Express and Atlas in chickpea for lots of functional genomics study, breeding application. Same thing in the pigeon pea or groundnut. So basically, you need to understand the Gene Express and dynamics also in the crop. So this is that uh, other area that where we are working. Lastly, as Dr. T. R. Sharma mentioned, that well, whether sequencing one genome is enough? Probably not. Why? And just see here that if somebody has sequenced one cultivar, this yellow color thing, and other person has sequenced this. 
uh, green color thing and the other one is blue color then you can see and this was the result from the analysis of several individuals of the different crop species that now when you are having these three genomes only some genome is common across all three some ge some genes are common between two and some are unique to each of these cultivar what happens if your gene of resistance or some important trait is present in this portion but you have sequenced this genome then you will not be able to target that gene so basically based on these things we are talking to sequencing not just one individual but several hundreds to thousands of the individuals and this is a concept of the pen genome and we have extended this concept of the pen genome to the super pen genome and we are talking that now for instance in the case of chickpea where we are having eight different sizes species for each species we should develop a pen genome and then we should develop a super pen genome for the entire size of genome as size of genus and we are working on this aspect and based on these things we have sequenced few years 300 pigeon pea lines then this work has provided the information about the center of origin of pigeon pea in Madhya Pradesh also provided the idea that how pigeon pea was migrated from India to other countries but more than that while doing the phenotyping of these pigeon pea line, combining these data, we identified several genes associated with many breeding agronomic traits. Similar kind of work we did in the case of chickpea, where we sequenced 430 chickpea lines. And here we identified the genes of markers associated with yield under drought and heat stress so that we can deliver the lines for the climate change uh, ready chickpea varieties. So this is the way that we are moving. And recently, we also have completed the sequencing of more than 3,000 chickpea lines. And this work was mainly funded by Ministry of Agriculture, Department of Agriculture and Cooperation. We had a lot of collaboration with ICR, ICR Institute, like Indian Institute of Pulses Research, many state agriculture universities. So what we have done, we have sequenced more than 3,000 lines at 10x coverage, and we are analyzing these data. But on top of that, we have also phenotyped all these 3,000 lines at six different locations, Kanpur, Bhopal, Sihor, Patancharu, Junagad, and Jaipur. So all these things, and we have we have phenotyped those traits. We have phenotyped these lines for breeding related traits. So basically, we got the sequencing data, we got the phenotyping data, and based on these sequencing, and I will go back, I will come back to that point later. But other thing is that when you would like to use them in the breeding program, what we breeders need that they need to have some cost effective genotyping platform so that they can screen their breeding population, their mapping population, their germplasm in that cost effective manner in this aspect while after sequencing generating different kind of resources we have developed large scale genotyping platform in each of our legume species including ssr dart marker genotyping resequencing whole genome resequencing 10 snip panel 2000 snip arrays because one size does not fit all sometimes if you need just marker assisted selection you use less number of snip sometimes when you would like to do the gvas analysis you do the 56000 snip array sometimes you would like to do the genetic map go for the gvs if you would like to go for the genomic prediction you just use the 2000 snip array so but what i want to tell that we have developed a suite of the genotyping platform and depending on your objective you can use that platform so now if you have a population if you have germplasm collection, you can use any of these platforms for genotype and sequence. Second, in the traits in which you are interested, then you need to phenotype those population in that field, in the real conditions, or in the high throughput phenotyping systems. One of, one of them is present in IRI campus. I have been to there several times, but nowadays the new type of these phenotyping platforms are coming, drones, etc. And the different kind of stationary platform, phenomobiles, phenopoles. And of course, all the, these platform we have at Ecreset also for like drought tolerance, we are having the lazy scan, lysimeter, and we are also doing the free, this waste free, phenotyping. So when we are developing either those large scale biparental or multi-parental population or junk plant collection, we have a possibility to screen them at large scale. And I think many of ICR centers, they already have that kind of possibilities. So basically from these sequencing data or genotyping data, when you got those sequencing genotyping data, you got the phenotyping data, then by using these approach, either linkage mapping or association mapping, you try to identify either nucleotide or genomic segment associated with the different trait. And so in the case of chickpea, pigeon pea and groundnut, in which I'm having more interest for last 10, 15 years or so. So what we have been doing that we were sequencing genotyping, large number of population, large number of for a large number of phenotypic traits and during this thing we also have developed optimized new trait mapping approaches as well and while putting all these things together 
we are very much excited to share that we have been successful to map 20 to 50 trades in each of these crops like in the case of chickpea, drought, heat, salinity, etc. So these things will take a lot of time when you generate this first kind of mapping. But after that, they become very, very useful for different crops. And as we were talking earlier, Dr. Agarwal was mentioning about Dr. Sharma, his seminal work on mapping of the blast resistance, cloning of those genes. And as we know that now, you've got large number of those blast resistant lines in different genetic backgrounds, etc. So I think that this is the beauty that once you've got the trait, you can translate this thing in larger number of lines in very accelerated manner. And that's what now ICRISAT and our partners, including many ICR institutes, SAUs, we are working together in these different crops. In the groundnut, we got leaf rust, late leaf spot, iron deficiency, oil and protein content, similarly in the case of pigeon pea. So I think we got a lot of these genes and marker associated with the trait. Now the next step is, that how to take these genes to the field conditions because we would like to see this just publication is not helping us, right? So once we, publications are good because through these publications, you are sharing this massive amount of genomic information with the entire world and then anyone in the world can use that information. But most important thing is that we also need to demonstrate, we also need to use the genomic information in breeding program. And we are working very closely with Ministry of Agriculture. For instance, right now, even the Secretary Honorable Agrawal Saab or earlier Secretary Patnaik Saab and many other colleagues there and our Director General of ICR, Dr. Mohpatra, Dr. Tia Sarma. So while working with them, and while working with many directors of those different institutes or vice chancellor of universities, we are trying to put several proposals together that how we can translate this information from genomes to the field. And I will give some of these examples in coming slides. So now for use this genomic information, the breeding, as I said earlier in 2005, we gave a concept of the genomics assisted breeding and several approaches, which are the part of the genomics assisted breeding, including marker assisted selection, marker assisted back crossing, marker assisted recurrent selection, AVQTL, many other approaches, they were part of that one. And these approaches have been successful in many crops to deliver the varieties. I will highlight some of those examples. And nowadays we are having the other approach, that new approach called, not new approach, but new concept of genomics assisted breeding 2.0, where we got another set of the approaches called haplotype based breeding, genomic selection, optimal contribution selection, or even the gene editing. And here we have put the gene editing in two ways, promotion or removal of the alleles through the gene editing, you call page, you call raise, and I will talk about these things in a minute. And now there's, there is new approach is speed breeding. So basically if you use any of these approach in combination of speed breeding, you can deliver the products in much more faster manner. And that's the way that we are moving now. So while doing these things, what we have been doing that we have been using this genomics assisted breeding and we think that we have been very su successful and ICRISAT does not release the variety, but basically we work with our partners and these are the partners who develop the varieties, who release the variety. Here in the case of chickpea way back in 2019, we developed that molecular breeding variety for the drought tolerance. Generally, we say that, well, higher root land density, higher root biomass is conferring the drought tolerance. And through the molecular breeding or genomics assisted breeding, we developed several lines which are having higher root biomass, root land density, and then following those countries' rules and regulation. They're here, like for instance, in India, we have these IVT, AVT. Similarly, in Africa, you have NPT and many other kind of process. So through these things, one of those lines was released as a variety called Jelly 2, which was named after that one of the pulse geneticists from Ethiopia. And this variety is providing the yield of 3.82 tons per hectare as compared to these other Czech varieties like Tecre, et cetera. So this is success story from the EIR. And now I will be highlighting another story. And this is coming from the IRI from Dr. Bhardwaj. And while working together, we have developed this line, drought tolerant variety, Pusa Chickpea 10216. This was also released in 2019. And this was done by introgression of the QTL hotspot in genetic background 372. And this is having 16% higher yield over recurrent parent Pusa 372. And this also high protein content, etc. Another example is coming from the University of Agriculture Sciences, Raichur, and he's Dr. Mannur, who was a chickpea breeder several years back in 1980s, early 1980s, he developed this variety called Annegri 1, became susceptible for Fujirum wilt, but now through this marker assisted back crossing, we have developed this improved version, he called it Super Annegri 1, and this was also released 
in India from the CBRC in 2019 and also, we are improved several other lines, like for instance in Madhya Pradesh, JG74, etc. And last year, the, this was another variety coming from the IRI of ICR, and this was the PUSA chickpea manav. This is for the fusion of milk resistance, which is having 28% higher yield advantage over recurrent parent and also higher seed weight, etc. So these are several success stories for the chickpea. So you can see that we have success storage for the drought, we are having for the fusion build, which are the important component trait. And this is very exciting project and we feel very proud of that one. And sometimes I say that, well, we have several papers in nature journals, but this paper is much more important than those papers. Why? Because in this paper, we have summarized the work of several institute, including IRI, IIPR, and also Rani Lakshmi Y University and PAU, et cetera. So while working together in this paper, we have highlighted that how the cute kill hotspot introgress and has enhanced the yield in three leech cultivars. Some of them, they are already in this advanced variety trial. And uh, so now you can see that in AVT2, we are having right now three drought tolerance, one fissurum wilt resistant variety, AVT1, we got five drought tolerance. So I think in coming years, we will be having many more products. And this kind of work, is getting attention basically from the outside world as well, like from United States, American Society of Agronomy, they have very nice story about the breeding of wetter chickpea. Same thing here from that uh, in India that uh, that how the genomics is working for developing those better chickpea varieties. Same thing in the case of groundnut here, I would like to highlight an example in collaboration with the director of groundnut research. If you see the groundnut varieties, majority of the groundnut varieties, they are having basically, if you see the oil composition, that 20-30% linoleic acid composition, which is not good for health. And we are having the oleic acid, which, but majority of these varieties, they are having limited oleic acid. But now through the genomics assisted breeding, we have developed several lines, which are having more than 80% oleic acid. And India also released Girnar 4 and Girnar 5 varieties as the first set of the high oleic groundnut varieties. And these varieties, groundnut, granar 4 and granar 5, they were included in the set of the 17 biofortified crop varieties, which our prime minister, Mr. Modi, he dedicated last year on the World Food Day on the 75th anniversary of FAO. So these kind of success stories are happening. Similar kind of thing we are having now for the foliar disease resistance. And these lines, they are in the AVT2 and now like a director of groundnut research is coming up with the next set of the varieties for the high oleic. And some of these varieties, when we are taking these things to our other partner organization, like here, this example of Ghana for the foliar disease resistance. And this, some of these lines, they are showing really very good, good resistance level on those existing varieties. So I think that we are, I'm not putting those slides here, but some of these lines, they are also going in the advanced release process in those countries as well. And now in here in India also, University of Agriculture Science Dharwad, Dr. Ramesh Bhatt uh, has also released two varieties for this foliar diseases called DBG3, although they were the state release, DBG3 and DBG4. So I think now in these crops, in chickpea, groundnut and pigeon pea also, many things are in advanced stage. So we started to have these products from the genomics. And now you can see these kind of slide that where we are having these foliar disease, now we are merging foliar disease and high oleic, and you can see very clear cut picture of these foliar disease susceptible and foliar disease resistant line. So these things are happening now. Recently, some of you already know that this success story from uh, CCS, HAU and decrease at long back of HHV67 improved cultivar and this HHV67 improved cultivar is grown in more than 875,000 hectare area in those pulmonate growing regions. And some of the estimate indicate that alone in Haryana, this hybrid HHV61 improved was very helpful and provided about $13.5 million. Now, ICRISAT, CCSHAU and other partners across Permilat or so, they have developed the another set. And I think last week or so, this was also released, HHV67 improved second version. And this has been released for the A1 in A zone in Rajasthan, Haryana and Gujarat. So I think that this is going to be make another success story in India. I gave the example of ICRISAT mandate crops, especially those crops where we did not have many resources. In fact, several colleagues from ICR system like Dr. A.K. Singh from IRI, Dr. R.M. Sundram from Indian Institute of Rice Research, Dr. Kuldeep Singh from PAU, now he's in NBPGR, and Dr. N.K. Singh, there are many colleagues, and of course, Dr. T. Mohopatrasa when he was in IRI and when he went to Odisha or so, Dr. T. So these people also have been the pioneer 
in delivering those genomics assisted breeding products in many crops and i was just having quick updates and while working with several colleagues and some colleagues from micri side or so and i was so much happy to see and this is the slide i have put to show that one that even alone rice you are having now many varieties for blast resistance blv low soil phosphorus tolerance etc and there are a lot of number of these things that now even that submergence tolerance you are having drought tolerance together and all these things they are really tells the success story that how we can take the genomics and breeding interventions in this development of those varieties so this is that several examples of rice and not only rice there are many other stories in the wheat i was talking to dr gp singh dr ratan tiwari and many other colleagues that even in the case of wheat now they are having these varieties for rust resistance they are having for that basically biofortified wheat varieties and also in the case of uh, uh, maize for instance and this is classical example from dr hs gupta vivek qpm9 and then many hybrids they were developed from iri dr filoj hussain and many other partners now even indian institute of maize research has come from this low fighted maize so there are many success stories of translating the genomics and the breeding program sometimes we don't recognize but then i want to tell that yes genomics work breeding work and so genomics is not just restricted to the publication because many times we have this notion genomics people just publish the paper no they are so basically they also provide the tools and technology and now we need to accelerate this thing further that how we can make this pipeline much more stronger so this is the something which is happening so you see remember i was telling earlier 75 years back in 50 60s then i was telling that where we are now now the next question is where we would like to go what is next again from these advances in these different areas and for that purpose as many of us are already aware that as a breeder as a crop improvement scientist we are always interested to enhance the rate of genetic gain which is directly proportional of the selection intensity selection accuracy genetic variance and inversely proportional to years per cycle and we have discussed some of these issues recently in one of those invited article in that so what what we need to do that we need to do not just focus on the development of the population but we should also need to focus now on the continuously population improvement and then only that we can go ahead and in this context you remember i mentioned that way back in 2005 in the trends in plant science we gave the concept of genomics assisted breeding and after 15 years now they have published another issue 25th anniversary issue and they asked us that what do you think now and where we have reached from the genomics assisted breeding so we highlighted many success story but then we say now there are many new areas because as i showed it is possible now to sequence large scale genomes from the gene bank it is possible to undertake large scale phenotyping now earlier people were worried to use the gene germ plans lines in the breeding program because they say if you will go to the genetic diversity there will be less genetic gain you will be having the linkage drag but now because of this possibility of high resolution mapping it is possible to take the lines which are having good alleles and also having good diversity and sometimes this approach also called optimal contribution selection and we also have the possibility just not to identify the genes but also the haplotypes i will tell in a minute and we can go to the haplotype based breeding earlier people were just predicting the line based on one or two gene or locus but now it is possible to do the prediction based on the whole genome so this is another area genome wide prediction now gene editing is another important approach many times we are planning to you or we use a gene editing to improve something now based on the genome sequencing functional genomics if you can identify the good alleles you use these things for improving the beneficial alleles i call this approach promotion of allele through gene editing page if you got the harmful allele because now even from the chickpea research we have got the information how much genetic load we have in the chickpea genome which is not really good for the agronomic performance of performance of chickpea so question is how can you reduce this genetic load and how can you purge these alleles and for that you can remove these alleles through the gene editing so we basically would like to develop these varieties future crops and i will not go in the technical details but as i said so now through the sequencing you identify the genes you identify the different combination of those nucleotide variation called haplotype then based on the phenotype you identify the superior haplotype so for gene 1 for instance haplotype 3 is superior for gene 2 haplotype 1 is superior but now if you see some leading variety they may not have these desirable haplotype so the question is how you can improve 
or how can you replace this inferior haplotype by the superior haplotype? So this is the way we are moving in haplotype-based breeding. This is an example of pigeon pea, a Maruti variety, very popular in Karnataka state. But if you see the analysis, this is having many inferior haplotypes, but you can convert these inferior haplotypes to the superior haplotype. So this is the process called haplotype-based breeding. Other approaches, as I said, and if you see, and this slide is coming from John Hickey from Roslyn Institute, and then if he is the animal breeder as well as plant breeder, so he works in both the direction, but he moved to the new company anyway. And from this thing, what happens in the plant breeding majority of time, we are focusing more on the product development that how we can get much more better variety. In animal breeding, they keep on focusing more on the population improvement, and nowadays this is the Thing they are saying that in breeding, we need to have the two part strategy. We should have the two population improvement. We should have the product development. And for the population improvement perspective, I think the genomic selection is one of those approaches. So what genomic selection does that based on the phenotyping data, sequencing data, you develop some models. And then you got you go to your set of the breeding lines. You genotype those lines with that marker platform. And based on the earlier model, you predict the performance. Now, if your lines are good, you take them to the next generation. But even at this stage, if our lines are predicted to be bad, you can remove these things. So you can even having the negative selection also. So for doing these things, you need to have the genomic resources, databases, and phenotyping platform, capacity development. And I think that for majority of these things, now in majority of the crops, we already got all these things well in place. And we are moving in this direction. So for instance, again, in the case of our crop, chickpea, groundnut, pigeon pea, together with IRI, IIPR, DGR, and also our international collaborators, Cornell University and Gobi, et cetera. We are working now for genomic prediction together with the ECRE program of Dr. G.P. Dixit in the case of Chickpea and Dr. N.P. Singh and many other partners that how we can deploy the genomic selection and some of our previous analysis that are providing us that you can have up to 0.9% of those prediction accuracy. Same thing in the case of groundnut, we have developed the models together with the director of groundnut research and in the case of pigeon pea, we are deploying the genomic prediction basically to predict the better set of the hybrid combination. And this data set has provided us some newer set of the combination which were never tried in past. And now we are making those crosses and we believe that these new hybrids will be providing much more higher yield or so. So basically genomic prediction is another approach where we need to invest our efforts. As I said, the gene editing is another very exciting approach where you can even edit a single nucleotide. There are many approaches, but nowadays CRISPR-Cas is becoming very, very famous approach. And here, this is an example from the uh, several organizations from Germany, United States, Italy, and these things, and what these people did, and especially for that, uh, for addressing the issue of the rice blight, they have used the rice genome information, promoter sequence information, and based on these things, they identified a nucleotide in the different sweet genes, sweet 11, 13, and 14 genes, and they developed the gene edited lines and they were found very blight resistant. In fact, some of us, including in the leadership of Dr. Mopatra, we wrote this commentary when Nature Biotechnology invited that well, how this genome editing can be useful and they have been useful in the rice. So similar kind of thing approaches we need to work, we need to continue to use these kind of approaches in the other crops as well for the other genes as well. Now, lastly, I would like to say about the speed breeding. And this is coming from Lee Hickey from University of Queensland. And we know that in several crops, when you are having generation cycle for one year, you need to take six to seven years to reach the homozygosity. Now in shuttle breeding, people could reduce this thing to the half time, but through the speed breeding, it is possible to undertake up to six generations per year. And this has been possible in several crops. Our Institute Ecclesiad is also working on this aspect to establish those speed breeding process. And I think when you use this speed breeding in combination of those different approaches, then you're ex you can have really accelerated crop development. So I think this is the immediate aspect that where we need to go. Now, future, future means 10 years down to the road or so, where we would like to go, how we can include these kind of much more uh, powerful approaches. And even some of these approaches, they may be failed. Some of may be successful. Some new approaches may come after five years. So we don't know, but then be, because it's really difficult to predict the future. But nowadays, this is one very powerful approach, which is called single cell transcriptomics. So here you do the transcriptome analysis in the single cell. So first is isolation of single cell is also very challenging. And after that analysis of these things, is really very, very powerful technology. And now in many human animal studies, these reports are there. 
plant species some reports came in that arabidopsis people are moving ahead in fact together with some chinese collaborators in 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 the case of groundnut also we have demonstrated the single cell rna seq and especially in that leaf billet so it is we have isolated the single cell from there and then we have tried to understand the mechanism the transcription factor which are responsible for the leaf billet but this was the basic study now if you would like to translate these things for the biotic stress resistance like for instance foliar diseases drought tolerance and what kind of network analysis we are having how we can select the genes that they will be basically interfering or rather say that they will be stopping those metabolic pathways etc so i think this is another important area we need to go now another area is the systems biology when we talk about the gene editing etc this is really good but for these things you need to have the gene and not only the gene you need to have that particular nucleotide which is causing the phenotype and many times we say that from the transcriptome analysis we can identify those genes but this is not possible but we are proposing now that you need to combine genomics transcriptomics proteomics metabolomics data together integrate with the network biology do the modeling and simulation and based on these things you should be able to identify the genes which link the genotype to the phenotype and these kind of approaches will be very very successful we believe that in coming years systems biology will be a routine approach for many crop improvement program now something other thing now for instance people are talking about synthetic biology where it is possible to synthesize and assemble the genome people have already demonstrated in the case of for instance in bacteria e coli where this approach was used to synthesize about 10752 new genes the question is that is it possible in next few years to have the synthesized genome for the plants etc we need to see but these are the approaches for future now new approaches that forget the even the synthesize everything that can you write the genome so for instance when we are having the editor in that our ms word etc we can write or we can edit that section of the paragraph by using these kind of technology can you edit the genes and you write the new version of the genome so i think this is the other area that where we need to go ahead anyway so these are some of the future approach now you develop the new technology of varieties by any method but this is very important that this should be reaching to the farmers in the real time in many developing countries including in our country in india i think this is also very important that we need to have really good agriculture extension system and also when you are talking about doubling farmers income etc i think we need to have really good policy interventions and we are very much pleased to see that even at the current stage that because agriculture is very important for any country and especially for india there are many policies and they are really very farmers uh, pro farmer farmer centric and these are very helpful and i think our request to our policy makers or those uh, people that well they need to keep on coming up with this new policy and they are pro they should be pro for science they should be pro for research and also for the farmers so i think this is already happening and because of these policies when we had this pandemic and all of us feel very happy about one thing that well not about pandemic pandemic is really worse but during the pandemic when everything was going down agriculture was the only sector which we still continue to remain in the up and you can see mining manufacturing construction hospitality everywhere this is just because of those good policies etc and i think that that's the way that we need to keep on moving ahead so anyway so friends i try to tell and basically try to tell the story 75 years back then what happened what is happening now what needs to happen in future now i am having three bullet points for the suggestions or so and i think that one bullet point and this was already this question was asked by nature biotechnology and trends in plant science to me and they were highlighted in their special issue they asked where plant breeding will be moving in next 25 years we said we cannot predict for next 25 years but we can really tell in next 5 to 10 years i think it is possible now to sequence not just two three or so basically hundreds to thousands of lines not only the whole genome it is possible now even to the single cell rna seq and people are even going for the meta volume etc so you will be having huge amount of sequencing data we are talking about generation of huge amount of the phenotyping data now the question is that we need to use the artificial intelligence machine learning approaches so that we can make the better prediction with the better precision for the plant breeding program and i think india being a country for the it or wild thing or so so we can really need to do something in this area that how we can use these technology in the research also for these artificial intelligence and so and i think overall 
by using a set of these different things, we need to develop the better varieties, which India has been doing. We will need to continue to do it. But the other important thing is that we need to just not think from this perspective that how we develop the elite variety. We need to see the entire agri value chain. So for instance, how much in how much or how, how should I say like in the shortest time, the elite varieties should be reaching to the farmers. And when they are reaching to farmers, if you are not having that good agronomic inputs, then you cannot realize the full potential of genetics from these seeds, from these new varieties. So through the decision support tools, farmers need to have the better agronomy. And when you are having this better produce, then you need to also reduce the issue, address the issue of the post harvest losses. Farmers need to be connected to the markets through the different kind of system. And then you need to talk about the value chain. You need to talk about the processing. So basically this way, we need to think about the entire agri value chain. So this is the second point, which I want to tell. Third point is, and I know that in this presentation, there are many policy makers are also sitting and they already know this thing, but here again, I'm bringing the slide from Professor Pentel's uh, presentation paper. Now you see many countries in Southeast Asia, for instance, South Korea, and if you see in 60s, et cetera, they were not having that kind of developed nation or so, but now last 20, 30 years, South Korea has these, and because of their percentage of the GDP investment in R&D. Now see Germany, USA, China, etc. Now India, unfortunately, here the investment is much more lower even than the low and middle income countries. Can we sustain agriculture by having that kind of investment? So in this case, I think this is a call for all of us that we need to think we have done a great job during last 75 years, we are doing great, but we need to go ahead also from these countries. And I think this is really important that we need to enhance this investment in the research. And I'm not talking agriculture, agriculture may be much more lower. So basically we need to enhance this thing, at least bring it to 1%, more than 1.5%, et cetera. You see these countries where they are going. So I think this is really important that we need to think about this investment in R&D in agriculture. When we say about the agriculture budget, major to your time, which is also very important for the farming subsidy, for all these things, et cetera, this thing. But let's talk about the research and development also. Anyway, so the take home message, I think, I wanted to tell that Indian agriculture is a success story. Both science and policy interventions have contributed to agriculture growth in the country. And genomics and breeding innovations, they enhance precision and efficiency of crop improvement programs for developing more suitable varieties. Next generation GAV version 2.0 approaches like haplotype based breeding, genomic selection, gene editing, along with the speed breeding, they are expected to accelerate varietal development process further. Management, agronomy, and market access are required to realize the full genetic potential. International, national, and local government or agency support for R&D is very much required. For new approaches like biotech, conducive policy environment is very much required. With these things, and I would like to thank several colleagues, here I have mentioned their names, who have helped me to put this presentation directly or indirectly from several of them. I got some slides from several of them. I had some indirect interaction from India and also from the ICRISAT and also some of my friends from Italy. So thanks to all of them for helping me to put up this presentation. And lastly, I would like to mention that majority of the research which I presented in this seminar, this was the result of large number of colleagues from our Center of Excellence in Genomics, from our collaborators and partners at ICRISAT and also many other institutes from India and around the world. And we feel very proud and privileged to work with them. And thank you very much once again. And I will be very happy to answer any question. Thanks a lot for providing me this opportunity. Back to you, thank you. Dr. Sharma. Thank Dr. you, Dr. thank you, thank you, Dr. Vasne. Uh, I will request uh, Dr. T. R. Sharma uh, to uh, give his uh, chairman's remarks. Okay, thank you, Dr. Rajiv Vasne, for this excellent talk. I think being from the same field, I really consider it as a treat of the evening. And uh, we got a very good treat from Dr. Great. Ashne. And uh, talk, starting from the independent India 75 years back, till date, I think he has touched upon almost all aspects of agriculture, starting from green revolution to gene revolution. And that's where we have to now work. And how he has shown that if we know the technological intervention, then 
how one can speed up the whole process of reading. That's the take home message probably we could get from him. And I'm not going to repeat what he has already said, but I would like to say that uh, 25 years back, these all technologies were probably not known. We, we were even not knowing marker assisted selection, only we were thinking of developing molecular linkage maps and mapping genes of the for different traits. But this is the development which happened in last 25 years or so, wherein not only we could uh, sequence the whole genome starting from Rhabdopsis, we should talk about plant species in 2000. And now more than 400 plant genomes have already been sequenced and 10 very important genome were sequenced by Dr. Rajiv Vashna and his group. Uh, so, application of genome sequencing, he has already talked about giving very, very nice examples of uh, uh, genome-wide association mapping and genomic selection as well as marker-assisted selection. So, in spite of the fact that we deal with 85 crops in, a, in India, in ICAR, I would say, ICR means in India, for uh, different uh, programs, but only this marker-assisted breeding is applicable in seven to eight crops. Still, there is a lot of gaps and one has to target those gaps to fill those gaps, which are now we have in other crops of uh, major significance. We are talking about cereals, and I, as I already told that the pulses, which have become now a model species with the availability of genome sequence available with us. Uh, and probably because of that and policy intervention, we have seen another revolution of pulse revolution wherein from 2017 to 21, even yesterday, ever during our interaction with the Honorable Minister of DG Saab was telling that Dr. Mahapatra was telling to our minister that after green revolution, if any other revolution has come in agriculture, it is pulse revolution. More than seven to eight million increase uh, in, in pulse production within a gap of three to four years. So, and, and that happened because of technological advancement, because of uh, policy intervention, and because of the hard work of our farming community. I think that we should not forget that we, our major stakeholders are farmers and uh, whatever we are doing that can be judged, best judged by the farmers. And now we have many, many varieties which are available in uh, public domains and more than 71, which are biofortified and more than 55 varieties from around eight crops which were developed through marker-assisted selection and some of the example Dr. G. Vashne has given. Uh, and, and you might have seen the application of genome sequence available with us, whether it is transcriptome or whole genome sequence. Not only it is limited to development of DNA markers or gene chips or mapping genes, but if now if we talk about genome editing, if you don't have genome sequence available with you, you can't do genome editing. For genome editing, there are three basic prerequisites which I always tell. Number one is genome sequence of that particular target crop. Number two, the gene to be edited, this information to be known. Number three, transformation protocol. So, so that we, we know that most of these genes are present in uh, uh, gene families multiple genes are controlling the same trait. So until less you target a particular gene family and a conjured reason for its uh, editing, uh, your approach cannot be successful. And not only that, now even in transgenic development, when we are talking about biosafety uh, issues related to transgenics, and it is now becoming mandatory that we should get uh, to identify the gene integration sites, a transgenic 
gene integration sites by sequencing of whole genome. That is now uh, uh, is is a, one, one of the requirement is becoming very very important requirement in in uh, uh, GAC as well as in other regulatory bodies. So uh, I'm sure that this whole approach will definitely get more momentum. Although uh, when we were involved in 2005, 2000 to 2012 in sequencing rice and tomato genome, I think that was a different types of approaches which were we were using to sequence those genomes. And then uh, now you have seen that one can sequence genome, single genome in a matter of one week's time, not even one week, even one day. So that, that's where technological intervention is very, very important. It, it could happen because of advancement in sequencing technology, advancement in statistical algorithm, which are used for uh, genome assembly. And many of those who, who are sitting here uh, who doesn't have much background in genome sequencing, I would like to tell them that if the genome has, say, rice has 470 million base pairs, that doesn't mean that you can start sequencing from one corner to another corner of whole genome. We always sequence it into a small, small pieces, and then one has to join those small sequence pieces into a contiguous stretch, and then you get complete pseudo molecules or chromosome. So that's that's where you need a lot of uh, advancement in computational methods, which are used for genome assembly and identification of genes. Uh, it's, it's really a, altogether a different types of uh, work when you are dealing with the genome of an organism. Of, or, or genomes of different cultivars of same species. It, it, it's really a very different type of approach when the Tau of pan genome or super pan genome, which Dr. Rajiv Vashne has asked about and, and given those concepts. So uh, in conclusions, I would like to say that uh, uh, until as the are aware of these technologies for which human resource development is very, very important. We cannot use the such approaches in our breeding programs. So human resource development is very important. And, and I always say that breeding should not be only technology driven. It should be trait driven. We should know which trait has to be adapted to be targeted for all using all these approaches and which is important nationally and internationally. And I would like to tell here Dr. Rajiv and all my colleagues sitting here, even when our DG interacted with Honorable Prime Minister, okay, uh, Dr. Mahapatra's interaction with uh, Mr. Modi, Dr. Mr. Modi told very clearly that we now, now we need short duration, multiple stress tolerant, nutritionally rich and varieties which are suitable for mechanical harvest. So now you can see the product profile, if we consider variety as a product, what profile even our honorable prime minister wants from us to be developed. So we, we should understand that now all these techniques are very, very familiar to even a common man because of Corona, you know, real-time PCR and RT-PCR and PCR has become a now a common name. Not only that sequence, daily on television, you, you listen these different types of discussions on sequencing of, of Corona strains and then identifying different types of strains, Delta strains or Delta 1 strains. So all these approaches which were alien 25 years back have now become, uh, a, a, I would say, talk of the town, and everybody knows about these approaches. And I'm sure that the talk which was delivered by Dr. Vashne has really set a diff different standard in, in a typical scientific and semi-scientific presentations. And I will really thank Dr. Uh, Agarwal that he has chosen such a 
beautiful speaker and at the top for this particular 75th years of uh, celebration of uh, uh, India's independence, which we are celebrating through different programs. And this is one of the flagship programs of ICAR, where we are organizing all these talks. And Dr. R.C. Agarwal, DDG Education, my colleague, is responsible for this whole uh, series of uh, lectures, which you will be listening so many uh, uh, speakers in future too. So with these words, I would like to thank Dr. Rajiv for this very uh, energetic and uh, informative talk. And also all the uh, participants, particularly I could see uh, Dr. P.L. Gautam here in the audiences and his interest. And, and I'm really happy to see you, sir, Mashkar. And thank you very much for joining uh, uh, this lecture today uh, afternoon and many vice chancellors of different universities and director of different institutes of ICAR, they could make it to listen to Dr. Rajiv Vashne, although he is a well-known figure in agriculture community and plant community. So thank you very much. And thank you very much, Dr. Agarwal, for giving me opportunity thank to share this particular session. Namaskar. Thank you once again, sir. Uh, thanks to Dr. Vashne for uh, sparing time. I know this was a long due uh, lecture, but uh, because of this second wave of Corona, we could not uh, uh, materialize this. And then uh, th there were several other reasons, but uh, I wanted your talk to be in some free time when we can uh, have more audience. We can have really today, the, the kind of audience you see, they are all working in this genomic field. So for them, it is, uh, it is a, very useful information. And I can just say in this series, uh, we have very eminent persons like you. We have uh, in the past uh, the 13 lectures by none other than um, C.C. Ravi Shankar on uh, how to reduce the stress. We have the lectures by uh, our honorable MOS, uh, C. Sarangi, Prakashan Sarangi, and many uh, others uh, to come. Uh, the next lecture we have uh, by Kakoli Ghosh. Uh, she is working in the FAO. Food and Agriculture Organization, and she'll talk on the Sustainable Development Goals. She is the one who is working in the FAO uh, about all these uh, uh, things. And uh, like that, we have many more lectures to come. But for today, uh, today's lecture, we have been greatly benefited, Dr. Vasne, and I thank uh, uh, Dr. T. R. Sarma for chairing this session. Uh, I thank all, all the uh, participants, uh, Honorable Vice Chancellors, Dr. Gautam Sahab, uh, all the directors, all the persons, scientists, uh, sitting uh, and listening very carefully this lecture uh, from uh, the ICR institutes. And I see even uh, ICR institute directors, Dr. Kuldeep Singh and many, many others. And uh, so that has been a great talk, uh, Dr. Vasne. Thank you very much for uh, putting all efforts. I know it's very difficult to make such a beautiful slides <laughs> which you could make. So it could have taken a lot of efforts uh, for you. So thank you very much. And please stay connected uh, with this series. And the next lecture is on 9th of this month, 9th July. Uh, and uh, I'll just give you the details, the link and other things. So thank you and Namaskar. Thank you very much, sir, to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tigar Sarma, sir. And thanks all honorable vice chancellor, directors. So I'm really grateful to you for all this opportunity. And thanks very much.